Today we're at the Keziah Street Beach Access in Oak Island, North Carolina. It is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, and the Gospel reading for tomorrow is Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. This parable tells about a landowner who planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, put up a watchtower, and hired some uh, tenants to be his caretakers of the vineyard. When the crop came due, he sent three of his servants to collect his portion of the fruit of the vineyard. And the uh, caretakers abused and the servants and even killed one of them. And when he sent even more servants, uh, the caretakers also abused them. And finally, the landowner sends his son, thinking that the tenants will respect his son, and they kill his son. And at the near the end of the parable, Jesus asks the elders of Israel and the Pharisees, what do you think would happen to those tenants? And you know, their their reply was rather uh, violent. <laughs> um, they said he will bring those they said he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time so why did Jesus tell this story who is the landowner and the word uh, landowner is translated from the Greek oiko despotes or household master and in this parable the household master refers to God the Father. And the word vineyard here uh, refers to the people of Israel. And if you look at the Old Testament, and in particular Isaiah chapter 5, you can see that that's the case. And in verse 43, we're told that it now refers to the kingdom of God. So traditionally, uh, the vineyard was God's people. And... Um, the tenants that were responsible for taking care of God's people, um, I think these represent the leaders in the worldwide church. And who are the servants? I'm not really sure about that, but in my mind, I think of them as being the prophets that God kept sending to Israel to try to call them back to faithfulness to the landowner, the household master. And of course, the son would refer to Jesus, God's son. Now, the context of this parable is that uh, Jesus has already made his triumphal entry uh, that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. He's already made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's gone in and cleansed the temp temple of the money changers. Uh, you know, they had turned the temple into a marketplace and uh, he had uh, demonstrated his power over nature when he cursed a fig tree and it died. And then uh, we come up to where the um, elders of the, of the people and uh, the chief priest questioned, you know, what was the nature and source of his authority? And we've already talked about this. Uh, a little bit uh, and part of Jesus answer to that came in the parable of the two sons uh, one who said that uh, he wouldn't go in when asked to work in the vineyard and the other one that said he would and the one who said that he would go didn't go and the one who said he wouldn't go did go and Jesus then asked the question, you know, which one did the will of the Father? So that was the first test of the nature and source of Jesus' authority, uh, is that you can tell the nature and source of the authority that a leader is acting under. Don't just listen to what they say. Look at what they are actually doing. This is very important, very important. If you think about what has gone on over uh, my last lifetime 
and oh, just the last 50 years of uh, scandals that have rocked the church, there's a lot of people that were talking one way and acting another way. And, uh, and of course, we've had the uh, most recent example of that being uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. And now in this parable, we are told to look at another test of the nature and source of a leader's authority, and that is how those leaders, the tenants of the vineyard, how those leaders treat the landowner's son, how, how they, whether or not they honor and respect uh, Jesus. So, obviously the, t the tenants uh, in, this, in this case did not honor Jesus. And then uh, finally, um, there are some dangers to being discerning about leaders. Now, I'm not sure, you know, in the, in the first case where Jesus talked about the son that obeyed and the son that didn't obey, I'm not sure that the uh, leaders in, the, uh, in Jerusalem realized that he was talking about them. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But in this case where uh, Jesus then says that this parable is related to those who stumble over this stumbling stone of God's son, uh, that they're, they're going to not be the ones who tend the vineyard, who take care of God's people and help them to bear fruit. So just to recap here, God's expectations for church leaders is that they will help people to bear fruit for God and that they will honor and respect God's son, Jesus. And the thing that the evil leaders did in this parable was they were looking out for themselves. They wanted to keep all of the fruit not for God, not for the glory of God, but for themselves. They were asking the question, what's in it for me, instead of how can this glorify God? And so they understood that Jesus was a threat. When he told this parable and pointed out their abuse of their role of leadership, it says that uh, in verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. That's interesting, isn't it? When you hear the description of these tenants who abuse and kill the servants and the, and the son of God the Father, they recognize themselves in that parable. And, and then in verse 44 it says how they responded to that did they repent did they decide that they were going to give the fruit of the vineyard uh, back to God it says in verse 44 uh, I'm sorry in verse 46 they looked for a way to arrest him but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet so I'm going to put a link in the um, description below to a couple of articles in Christianity Today because I think some might look at what we're talking about here and believe that we're being disloyal. For too many years that was the mindset in the Roman Catholic Church and they wanted to sweep the scandals of child abuse, of sexual abuse, under the rug because they thought that by hiding what was wrong in the church and ignoring the victims that they were protecting, they were doing PR for the kingdom of God when of course as we've learned uh, when you try to cover things up instead of deal with them uh, it's not good PR it's actually done more harm to the Roman Catholic Church than possibly anything that's happened in its history. And the same is true of many local Protestant churches, where instead of dealing openly with the need to uh, discipline church leaders and to show that they actually care about the people that are being victimized, 
when, when, when they engage in that behavior, then it just institutionalizes church hypocrisy and it reinforces that perception of the public. And so I think it's very important that uh, we call sin, sin, whether it's in our own heart or whether we see it institutionalized in the leadership of our church and that we do not condone that corruption. So the, the function then of our leaders, if it's going to be biblical leadership, is that they tend to God's flock in such a way that that flock will bear fruit that brings glory to God and that the leaders themselves do this out of their own honor and respect to God's son, Jesus. So let's not fall into that trap of worshiping our leaders instead of our Lord. Let's not fall into the trap of thinking that church is about church growth or about entertainment value. Um, I don't know how many times in my life I've heard friends talking about, oh, you need to come to our church. We've got this uh, fantastic uh, worship team, meaning the, the musicians, the, and they're touting what a good show that is or what a good show the preacher puts on and how quickly they're growing. Well, there's, there's no merit in that as far as the standards that Jesus puts out in Matthew. The standard here isn't how good of a show do you put on, how many uh, churchgoers from less flashy congregations can you bring to your congregation. The mission of the church is to reach the world in such a way that they can be reconciled to God and then discipled in such a way that their lives will bear fruit for God and glory to God. And the only way that we can do that is being honest about who we are and who our leaders are and the important role of love and grace in our fellowship. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Until next time, may God bless you. Thank you.